Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the second episode of Magpie Tales. Hopefully giving you a little bit of an insight into Deerham Town Football Club. Whilst, of course, there is no football being played at the moment. Delighted to be joined by first team manager Adam Gustafson. Gus, how are you, how are you doing? Obviously, we, we're recording, what, half an hour or so after the official announcement from the league that the uh, the season has, has been curtailed. So I guess we, we better start by getting your reaction. Probably not really a surprise to you, I would imagine. No, I think we all we all obviously saw that coming, and yeah, unfortunately, we just weren't far enough into our our league program for it to be anything different to that, really. So we've kind of been preparing for that. We we've not expected anything differently, and um, I think it's the right decision, um, as unfortunate as it is. And uh, yeah, it's just good that we now know for definite. And like I say, we've got a start date for the new season, and I think every club like ourselves now will just be really focusing on on getting to that point and hopefully having a. Uh, a season next season which won't be interrupted as uh, the last two have been. Obviously on the first episode we had Ashley Bunn chairman Ben Dack on as well and the conversation we were having around the league was maybe that they they went into this season without a little bit of a plan as to what would happen in, in this sort of situation. Is that mainly where the frustration comes from? We're seeing it again now at sort of higher up the pyramid, National League level, we're, we're seeing clubs and, and this sort of dispute between playing on and, and not playing. Is that lack of plan throughout the pyramid something that's that's maybe frustrated you a little bit? Yeah, to a degree, yeah. I think it's, listen, we all know it's a, an unprecedented time and what's happening and, and it's very difficult to, to cover every um, scenario off of what's been happening. And I think possibly when we, we went back, maybe there could have been a little bit um, more done before the season started in terms of, you know, this is what will happen if we pick this situation. But again, it's ever evolving and you probably can't cover off everything and people will always find a loophole. So I think it's been difficult. Um and it has been, yeah, challenging for, for everyone, challenging for leagues, challenging probably for the FA. Um, for clubs, it's obviously been a challenge in terms of, and, and what Ashley and Ben were, were saying in the previous um, episode was correct, you know, a lot of work that's needed to do to, to crisis manage and to make sure we get through, but also having that ability to look ahead and try and, you know, make use of the time that you do actually get from the situation that's been presented. So it's been, yeah, I don't, I don't think, like I said, I don't think, Maybe there could have been too much more done. Um, and like I said, at least now we know where we're at for definite. And um, yeah, we can continue with our preparations um, as we kind of have been this last probably month or two with this in mind. Uh, how nice is it as a manager to know that that security is there? It won't be the same for everyone in, in your position at clubs, particularly in, in non-league at the moment. And obviously there'll be some real concerns at some clubs about what the future holds and the financial situation. It, it must be really nice not to have to worry about that aspect as a manager, I guess, and, and to be able to focus on maybe the planning for next season. Obviously, the start date that you've mentioned is, is a really bit of positive news, obviously, with the, the roadmap we've had as well this week, which I think everyone is hoping um, sort of comes to reality and comes to fruition because everyone wants to be at Oldest Park watching football, everyone wants to be at a football ground watching football, but having that security of, of the finances and knowing the club is managed in the right way, that must be a, a crumb of comfort, I guess, in what has been a, a really difficult time for everybody. Yeah, it's a really good point. Um, I think the big big word I'd use is trust. And I, I, I trust Ash, Ben, Ben Williamson, all, all the guys involved in our football club um, behind the scenes. And, and I trust them that they will do right by the football club. And, and they have done, you know, the amount of work that those guys have, have put in. Ash especially and, and, and Ben Williamson especially have been, been brilliant just making sure that, that, yeah, we are, like we've always said, the, the, the objective from our side of the club was... It's, a, it's an awful situation, um, but not to dwell on the negatives, to try and actually come out the other side and try and be in a better place than what we went in. And I think we've achieved that, be it through, um, you know, there has been grants that we've made, as, as every club will have done, you know, made use of um, and capitalised on. But aside from that, we've had a real good chance to to really set a vision, I think, and to really understand where we want to take the football club. and. And to do that, you've got to plan properly and we've used that time and Ben guys especially have used that time to, to really start looking at that. So uh, you're 100% right. Our operating model, I think, in these sorts of scenarios probably helps us, as, um, as was touched on previously when they spoke. You know, we're not a club that's got one massive sponsor or has a massive wage bill or has things that you are relying on one or two factors or people to keep going. We have a model where football club can run itself and and you know I think that in the you know in the situation that we're in and we're going to continue to probably be in with sponsorship being more difficult etc 
I think puts us in a in in a, in a you know positive position with it really. Mm, absolutely, and in, in terms of how you're using this time, we heard last time about how sort of Ash and, and, and Ben are using the time to um, to look at the finances and, and you mentioned the crisis man- management and, and that kind of, sort of side of it. What about for you? How are you using this time? Is it about preparations for next season, looking at the squad, looking at maybe recruitment as well? That was obviously a big area that we, we know professional clubs use the time in the first lockdown to to really try and, and, and execute. Are they the main areas you're looking at and, and, and using this time to plan, I suppose? Yes. Yeah, exactly that. Um, so there's probably three players that we, we we kind of have in our mind about bringing into the into the club for next season so we're looking at that and, and trying to move that where we can um and then yeah yeah we're looking to attain obviously the, the the majority of the squad as well so um i think that has been certainly this probably this last month but it's been a bit of a funny one because um my attitude to this this particular lockdown was what was when we went into it was actually i think we all need a bit of a a break from it you know there was no sign of coming back to football anytime soon we were in November early November and I felt people probably just needed a bit of time themselves to to almost deal with things how they wanted to deal with things and it's different for everyone obviously everyone's got challenges the Covid was you know players you know in our group and obviously relatives and things like that I suppose people have been affected by it and you know it takes a lot out of people so I felt you know certainly early on in this lockdown there wasn't much value to be gained by by really focusing loads on football and really use the time a little bit, a bit of downtime really in, in terms of actually didn't engage hugely with the lads. We didn't have the weekly quizzes and stuff we were doing from previous lockdown and, and kind of just let it go for a little bit, um, which I felt was probably the right way to, to try and deal with it for everyone. But this last, probably this last two months really, um, certainly not coming into, into the new year, it's kind of, I think it's that point where you, you you can sort of see things getting the other side and and you kind of now can have that bit between your teeth and that focus. And genuinely, I mean, when the, as stupid as it sounds, when the league announces the start date for the next season, you, you're genuinely excited for that date because it's a date that you can you can look forward to. And uh, and yeah, and that's 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 kind of it, it gives you that focus. So yeah, to answer your question, 100%, um, certainly this last month and from here on in is all about preparation, all about recruitment, retention um, and getting in, in a squad that we we want going forward into next season. Was it nice to have that break? I expect as, as someone who obviously manages a, a club and you've obviously played the game for a number of years as well, that maybe isn't something that, that you've been afforded in, in or too too often, I suppose, in, in the last what decade or so. Yeah, no, the answer is no, it's, it's not nice. It was horrible for us. Our last game was a 5-0 nil. Um, battling at Michelover Sports and and probably the most annoyed I've been at a performance because I felt we, um, probably the first time I felt we we threw the towel in at about 3-0 and that's the one big thing for me is, you know, any any team that we're involved in never throws a towel in at any point and I went, I was angry that day Um, and then that was the last game so you're stewing on that for for, for forever it seemed. Um, So yeah, nobody wanted it. Nobody obviously wanted the break. We were very vocal in our disappointment about it because we felt that there was an opportunity with um, us and all the clubs in our league being in tier two as it was at the time. Didn't stop us from playing football. So it was purely the league's decision to stop us from doing that. Um, And we had a frustrating, really frustrating month, which really got to us because we've got all the clubs around us playing, literally every single one, Kingsland above us, Norwich above us. And then every single club that falls below us, every single one of them were, were, was playing football and we weren't. So we had that for around about a month, which was, yeah, I can't tell you how frustrating and annoying that was. And for the players as well, because the players just want to play. And, you know, they're then thinking, well, if it goes on much longer, you know, is you know, about dual registrations and things like that. So it really wasn't a great um, situation that we were in. Um, just like I say, being the only club in Norfolk that that applied to. But um yeah, we, we all miss it. You know, we all do it because we all love it. And, you know, when it's taken away from you, I think you, you realise how much you love it and, and why we all do it. So um, certainly felt that with the first lockdown and, and certainly felt it again with this this, this second one. So, um, yeah, just can't wait to get a season next season in which we'll just hopefully touch would be uninterrupted. And, and yeah, we can uh, we can all get back to it and, and back to normality. 
Mm, I was thinking that seems, seems a while ago since we were talking about tiers and tier one and two, but yeah. I guess that's that's kind of the existence at the moment. And before we, we get on to sort of discussing your, your career, so to speak, um, how do you feel that the squad is? Because it's, it's, it's a difficult time in terms of fitness because they've obviously had a, a spell of games and now quite a long spell of not playing and now they've sort of looking ahead and maybe don't have, um, well, they've got a few months certainly until the start of next season. What are you expecting from them in, in the weeks and, and months to come in terms of building up their fitness? And just a, as a second question, what are kind of your plans in, in, in this period to, to get your lads up and running again? Well, I think the first part to it is the lads are experienced enough. They know the level. They know what they need to do to look after themselves in this period. We, we've not We've we've not gone down the route of saying here's a training program you need to to to, to work to this. We haven't done that on on this one. Um, we did more so on the other one, but on this one we've kind of said you know it's a little bit down to you. It's your own responsibility, and, and they've got to do what's right for them, you know. And and but obviously make sure they they keep themselves in the shape they need to because as soon as they don't, they're on the back foot, and that's all the message that we can give them. Um, and I trust the players. We've got a group where fitness bits get popped in. Um, so, I, yeah, I think, you know, they, they'll look after themselves. Um, again, it's, it's one of them. I don't think they need to be doing anything hugely at the moment because realistically we aren't going to be having competitive football until August and or likely August, I, I should say. So um, I don't see that there's a huge amount of mileage in lads, you know, training four or five times a week and getting themselves ridiculously fit. That will come in pre-season naturally. We'll then come back in when we're allowed to. So I think March the 29th is, is, the, is the date that you know, I've, I've, I've seen that you know, training could resume. So around that date, we've put it to the lads. The lads have said, look, as soon as we can come back, we want to come back in some capacity. Um, so we'll probably just come back for, for that period. And, and it will just be socially as much as anything, getting the lads back together, you know, the banter at training that you have. It won't be anything that's too fitness heavy because, again, we don't want burnout and that will come in the normal pre-season, which will keep as normal um, so, so that, that, you know, we're not changing that. Um, but it will really be just to get the lads together, have a bit of fun, get the balls out and, and actually just get back to, to being where we love being, which is at the football club and with the footballs out. So that's our plan and hopefully the uh, situation will enable us to, to carry on with that. I'm sure the, just the final one before we, we get on to you, I'm, I'm sure the dear and fans watch you might forgive me if I, I don't ask you, you mentioned three potential players you, you were looking at. Is there anything you can tell us in terms of maybe specific positions that you're looking at? And feel free to play a very politician's answer on this. I'm not, not going to push you too hard at this stage, but any, anything in terms of maybe positions that you can tell us that you're looking at? Cool, good question. Um, to be fair, all positions, are, uh, all areas of the pitch. So... Um, up front, midfield, and defensively. So that and that genuinely is the three areas of the pitch we're looking for. I'm not going to go into any more specifics than that because we, we can't. But that's what we're looking at. We we feel if we can get, um, you know, that sort, you know, those players in to help help the group. And it, and to stress that is to help the group we've got. So we're not looking at wholesale changes or anything like that. Um, we've just kind of got three in mind that we think could make us better, um, and potentially help us in sort of games and situations last season and the season before where we were just short and they're the fine margins we work to in our league and um, yeah that's why we don't go and get six in six out I'll never be like that but three at most um, you know how things work we probably won't get all three we might not even get any and we have to go again that's just how it is but that's what we're working on and that's what we're looking to, to hopefully get over the line as they say. How, how far down the road are you with, with those three? I, I guess we're not talking about anything imminent or anything like that. No, no. And we have to be sensitive to where we're at and, and, and stuff. So, we, 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 you know, we've got um, the players in mind and, and yeah, we, we will have the conversations at the, at the correct time. Um, obviously, it's a funny time for everyone. And yeah, it's uh, kind of we're in a season, but we're not in a season. So we kind of just we just have to do things properly, um, which we will do as a club always do. So, um, yeah, we'll be speaking to those kind of properly and fully when that time allows us to excellent there we go hopefully that was that was good enough for the people watching but feel free to to pop any more uh, questions in and i'll try and uh, i'll try and throw them at, at gus and you might have a bit m bit more joy at, um at getting some answers than, <laughs> than maybe i did although um he's, he's of course always the the diplomat in terms of uh, those sort of things um let's let's ask you about uh, your your early career and um 
maybe joining Norwich and, and that sort of thing, where, where did your sort of footballing journey, if that's how you want to label it, that sounds quite a philosophical term, but where, where did that begin for, for you? When did you first discover this sort of love for, for football? I, th- I think like my, most people involved in football, I started young. Um, I, I, I was my local um, side old captain. So um, just, I think just trained with them. So kind of just went, went down to the recreation ground, started training with, with, with them. Um, and then I can't really remember. It, it, it was quite early on. I got, I can't remember, got put forward for a session, at like a, I don't really know, like a trial thing, I guess you'd call it with Norwich or whatever it was at the time. Um, so I'd done that and and kind of at that point, you're able to combine training with Norwich because it weren't, when I first was there, it wasn't an academy. It was, um, I think when I first started going to the sessions and stuff, they, they were then sort of going towards academy status. So at that point, you're able to just keep your toe in with Norwich and train, say, two two times a week, whatever it was, um, whilst also playing club football. So um, I ended up playing in a youth team with quite a few of, um, with Drayton they were and we ended up playing a year above ourselves there was um, Ross Jarvis was, was somebody that was in our team um, and there was a few others that were my age that were at Norwich that we, we played for Drayton the year up which I think kind of probably helped us a little bit um, and then done that probably until what would have been under 10s or 11s and then the academy status went went full um, when I was under it must have been under 10s at Drayton I was under 9s we went academy at under 9s and uh Yes, that stayed through the system all the way through until getting released um, as an 18 year old, I think I was, um, as a scholar. So, yeah, that was my journey and, and pretty much that was it. So, yeah, from Norwich, at Norwich, from yeah the age of probably seven through to 18 was, was pretty much my kind of youth career, if you like. Um, and then, yeah, straight out of that. And uh, that's when the love affair started with, uh, with Dean. Of course, of course. And we'll get on to that. But in terms of going into an academy system and, and being a young player who played for Norwich, what was what was that like for you as a 10-year-old? It must have meant quite a lot, I would imagine. Yeah, I mean, I, I hear a lot of conflicting views from people on academies, whether they're healthy, whether they're not. And I think there are very, very probably casing arguments both ways. Um, but, but, you know, my experience was that I, 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 enjoyed, I enjoyed it. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's football at the end of the day, you know, when you sign a scholarship that you, uh, you know, it's still a long, long way from that point to becoming a pro and, and going through through the system. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, no issues on any any of my experience with it. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I had a lot of good coaches. Um, and yeah, I'd, I, I, I'd speak positively about it. Um, but it, it, it's huge. You know, when you do look back on it, there's huge... You don't at the time, but you look back at it and think, well, actually, there is a big sacrifice because there's a lot of things that you don't do and you miss out on because you are so committed and so professional at a young age to your to your sport and to your football. And you know, even your parents have to make massive sacrifices. You know, training as a you know ten year old or whatever it is, three four times a week. You know, you've got games away in London every other Sunday, um, and it's it's huge. Um, so there's all of that that does you know factor into to the whole being in that process if you like but no from, from, from my side of things I, I you know not a bad word to say about any of it I, I thoroughly enjoyed it and um, yeah I think it's it's you know great to like you say be involved at a professional club and see how things are done for, for such a long period of time. How did the how did you feel about the release because obviously that's kind of the cliff edge isn't it for young footballers when they do get released and like you say you, you're a scholar so maybe you'd, you'd had that kind of dream of being a professional dangled a little bit was was that quite hard to take at a young age that that release from an academy it wasn't because you know when you're in when you're in the building full time you, you know and there, there there's no surprises I would say that so there wasn't I wasn't there thinking right I, I've I'm, I'm amazed I haven't got a professional contract here. It wasn't one of those scenarios. It was, I could see it coming. You know, you sort of know probably going into your second year as a scholar where you're at. Um, and yeah, I, I, I kind of my outlook and everything is, you know, you can't dwell on, on, on things like that. And, and it was very much, I was very quick um, to, to, to not go down the route of trying to get, you know, I remember uh, there's a, a thing with Cambridge United, which we could have gone and stuff like that. And I was, I was kind of very quick on actually now's the time to 
to, to, to get my life where it needs to be and do football enjoyably alongside sorting out what I do in life. And, and that's kind of was, was, was probably quite quick to think like that, to be honest. I didn't really have any, you know, um, keenness to go in America or anything like that. So, no, I, I was OK. I took it quite well. And, um, you know, Ollie, obviously, you know, we all think of Ollie and um, Ollie had kind of been through the process before me. So he'd got released the year before. And, um, you know, again, people like Ollie and, and Nicola had gone through it, had been released. They were my, my, my friends going through and you kind of, you know, you, 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 you know, that can happen and kept in contact, obviously, with those guys and stuff. And, um, yeah, it just makes it a bit easier when that does happen, that they're kind of there for you. And, uh, yeah, so it was, it was one of them. You know, you, you kind of know where w- what was going to happen and it wasn't uh, wasn't the end of the world as some people might think it could be sort of thing. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Am, am I right in saying there was a serious knee injury at some point as well at, at Norwich? Did that did that hold you back a, a little bit or did it hamper maybe your, your development or lower the ceiling maybe that you that you could have reached yeah I'll, yeah I, I'm always conscious about talking like this it sounds like yeah everyone says they had a knee injury don't they which stopped them from becoming a professional that, that's all right I, I say I say if I had more <laughs> yeah. ability I'd have been a professional footballer so <laughs> yeah. that's that's fine um yeah I mean it didn't help I I, I had yeah I was unfortunate I had uh, I'd, I'd signed uh, the my scholarship actually a year early so I'd signed it um along with, uh, well, there was four of us, there was me, Joe Lewis, Ross and Jarvis and Andrew Fisk, we got offered it a year early because we we, we were, I guess, highly thought of at that point. So um, they did do that. And um, it was, no, I'd signed the scholarship and I remember it was probably uh, maybe a month or so, not even that, after I'd signed it, my um, my knee dislocated, but real bad dislocation and um, obviously had some, some, well, had to have it operated on firstly, um, came back, but they'd only done like a mini operation, a keyhole to basically just clear up where the knee had been um, basically clipped. So the knee had sort of broken, the bit of the bone had broken off. So they just cleared that up and then it went again. So went in for some more tests and they found, you know, it was a bit more of a serious problem. Um, basically where the kneecaps sit really high and they're prone to dislocate. So it then required quite significant surgery. And then um, I was out for probably all told about 18 months. So I was out for a good, good, good while with it, um, but came back and like I say, the, you're in a good place because the physios, are, you're there full time and they do everything, you know, to make you come back, hopefully fitter, stronger and, you know, able to deal with it all. So yeah, it's like, you know, players have injuries. I, I remember, um, they were saying to me, where's Brown as an example? I think he had three cruciate knee ligament injuries by the time he was 22 and he went on and has an unbelievable career. So, you know, I don't think it was anything to do with that. Probably didn't help at the time, but, you know, these things happen and you have to come back from them. Have you got any nice stories? Of, I, I don't know if you ever did train with the first team or anything like that, but any any nice stories of, of your time there or um, any experiences that, that you had? Yeah, we, we used to train with the first team quite a lot. Um, we They always had a, uh, what they'd call like a pattern of play session where they'd set up an 11 v 11 against a youth team um, and they would go through the, the, the team and how they want to play on the Saturday. So, um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the Nigel Worthington was the manager at the time and uh, I honestly dread to think where Norwich would have been with without Darren Huckabee because every single thing went through him every single thing was to get the ball to Hux um you know and that, and that was literally everything that was ever kind of told and, and you just dread it because when I used to play centre half or right back and obviously Hux was st- stupidly quick he still pro- he still is looking at some of these runs that he does but back then he was super quick and we'd all be there thinking Christ we know that every single bit of play is going to be coming down the left hand side and you're sitting there as a youth team player not wanting to be set as right back to play against Hux in an 11 v 11 where he's going to get the ball for 90% of it. Um, and there's a few times where I did, I ended up playing right back up against him. And uh, yeah, it was uh, <laughs> it was interesting. It was always a good challenge, put it that way. Um, and I always remember Wormington would always say, if ever you know you went near a first team player or the ball was in the air and you're challenging in the air, it was, if it was near Hux, like, it, careful, 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 slow down, like used to protect him like anything but um yeah we used to train with him and we you know there's a, a couple of times where i was in the squad for the west we had an fa cup game they had a massive massive injury um loads of injuries and um 
there was, I think there's three or four of us that were sort of in the squad, so we were in the changing room. One of us was not myself, but um, Andrew K. Flan, it was, managed to get onto the bench. Um, so, yeah, that, that, was a, that was a good experience being in amongst it for a match day and then obviously going up and watching the games from the, the, the box sort of thing. So, yeah, loads of good experiences. And like I say, I wouldn't change any of it for, 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 for the world, really. It was all, all good. Just a, a couple of final nice bits on, on your time at Norwich. You you were the, the second youngest player to play for the reserves. I don't know if you know that behind um, Rossi Jarvis. So that's that's uh, that's that's a pretty good stat. And then there's a nice quote that I, I found from um, former academy director Ricky Martin about you as a player. And he said, Adam's one, we use an example to the young schoolboys in terms of what's required of them passing wise, short and long off both left and right foot, something that he's only achieved for a lot of hard work. So that that's, that's quite a nice quote from someone I think who's at West Ham currently. So so um, it's that's not too bad to have on your CV. Ricky Martin always knew his stuff, always knew what he was <laughs> talking about. Um, yeah, no, that's right. Yeah, I remember me and Ross, it was in the same game. We played uh, Brentford, it was. And again, I think the youth team, we were only 14, 15. Can't really remember. I think it was, yeah, I think that's, I think he was 14, I was 15. So I don't even know if we, we should probably even have done, even done it because I don't know if youth players should have played in an adult game. But anyway, um, there's a massive, there was a youth cup game. So all the youth players, we were involved in that and obviously the reserves had a game um, and they didn't want to you know use many first team players or whatever so um yeah i remember we we both come on uh, on the hour um i think rossi played right back and i i played right wing i think it was just to fill a fill a gap but i remember got the call when i was at school like we we need you to to play so i was literally at school during the day got to the game and uh yeah that that was that so it was uh, yeah a bit of a, an interesting day at the time yeah yeah Brilliant stuff. Talk to us about your your process of of joining Deerham after after leaving Norwich. What sort of I mean, you've kind of mentioned Cambridge and, and maybe America as as being options. What made you go down the the local football route? Um, well, like I say, I was I was fairly um, early in my mind that I wasn't going to pursue a professional foot playing career. I, you know, I, I probably had too many. I, I probably wasn't quite good enough to be completely honest, and I don't think I had the drive to really go down that route so um, yeah I, I mean I, I, I remember quite well I went to um, to Kings Lynn um, and played a, a couple of reserve team games they, they were doing really well at the time so they were um, whatever league it was in at the time they were in the playoffs because um, they got released and they sort of before the end of the season so it gives you a bit of time to go and sort of have a look at clubs and things like that so um, I went there at that point and um, and yeah, it was. Uh, I went there sort of in, in the next preseason, but I'd always kept in contact with Ollie and just especially Ollie, Nicky a little bit, but Ollie certainly. And um, they were at Deerham, so they, they they'd signed at Deerham and were obviously asking me to to to, to come to Deerham. Um, and yeah, I sort of went Kings Lynn preseason, and yeah, just kind of you, you, I wasn't wasn't convinced, wasn't sure, wasn't hundred percent sure if they were sure on me. Um, I actually had a chat with Matt Hemman, who was involved with Kings Lynn at the time, and Matt just had a real good, honest conversation with me around, you know, um, you know, you just got to either commit to Kings Lynn and see how it goes for the first few months, knowing that you may have to bide your time to get into the first team, or, you know, you've got an option of Deerham, which is a really good club, and there's that option which you you've got kind of thing. So, um, and then I went on the lads' holiday. I, I think this is how it transpired. I was, went, I think. It, lads holiday with Ollie and Nick I think that's what happened and it was constant it was um you know constantly in, a, in the in the ear to sign and stuff so um so yeah so kind of uh, a week with them two saying that was uh was enough to convince me I think and um yeah delighted that you know I'm, I'm so happy that I did and um yeah it was uh it, like I say uh, you know the time we've, we've had at the club and continues to have the club is time that we cherish you know we genuinely do so um so yeah I think that's how it all came about it's quite a while ago now but yeah that's that's I think how how it all came about and uh yeah signed there for for, for I think was the 2005-2006 season I think it might have been something like that so um yeah that's how how it all came about really there you go. That's what you need to do for your free targets. Get your get your first team <laughs> yeah. players to, to go on holiday with them and just constantly yeah. hound them about yeah. about signing. And, and <laughs> holiday, them over, yeah. yeah, and you'll get them over the line. That's uh, that's 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 a, that's a good it. tactic. Did, yeah. did you envisage when you first arrived at Aldis Park? Could you see yourself staying at the club like you did for for a number of years and and having the time that that you did there? Was that something that you kind of have felt as soon as you walked in, or do, would you say that's something more that developed over time? 
Um, no, I, I'd, I'd say it was it was fairly soon into it. Um, we, we've always been really fortunate. Always had a really good group of lads at Deerham, um, and that's what makes it. And I think as long as you've got that, um, you don't think about anything else really when it comes to your football. You just think, yeah, I like the lads, I like the club, I like the, everything about it. Um, as long as they're happy to keep me, I'm happy to stay. And that's very much how it was, to be perfectly honest. And I could see that quite early on. Excuse me. Um, when I joined him, it was um, very much that that case. And and like I say, you, you know, I had my friends there. Ollie's a close friend, and he's there. And you know, you you, you don't want to leave that. So um, yeah, I, I think so. There's other friends of mine and other lads that we then signed who were really good lads. And you know, the, the pleasing thing was over time we then were able to build um, a better team, a better squad, which obviously culminated in us getting promoted to, to the Ryman League, which was something that we all were, were desperate to do and were delighted that we were able to do you know, together, really. Um, so, yeah, it, it pretty much, I, I, I've never, ever, when I was at Durham, had any thought of playing for anyone else. And that's uh, genuinely what, how it was. I did leave, and that was really around when we had got promoted, and nothing more than um, a football decision, really, because... We had um, Matt Howard and then Dan Morphy who sort of had signed two outstanding centre-halves. J.A. Joe Smith, outstanding centre-half, who was sort of available sometimes. Um, and I'm a realist, and I could see that at that point, um, my time at the club had... The, the club can need to continue to evolve, and, and I fully appreciate that even more now in my position. You've got to evolve and you have to. And I was realistic enough at that point to know where I was at um, in terms of... of, of being in the top, you know, starting 11. Um, and that was kind of it, really. I, I felt that probably that was the right time and wanted to leave as well a little bit on the fact that, you know, the season before we'd had our best FA, FA Cup run. We'd got promoted um, on a personal level. I'd played most, pretty much all of the games and felt, you know, a good part of that squad and was, you know, leaving almost on that note opposed to, hanging around and, and, and not being quite at it and quite good enough. And that that's kind of where I felt it was it was sort of leading to. You, you mentioned there about maybe not necessarily seeing yourself play anywhere else. Did you have any offers to, to go higher up the pyramid? Did you have any options to, to leave Durham at any point during your, your playing days, apart from obviously towards the end? I had, I had two, well, one stroke two. I had um, Histon, who at the time were... At the, their reserves, I think, played in our league, and I think it came from that. And uh, Rob Taylor, who's the manager at the time, they'd, they'd approached um, Rob about um, myself and, and Danny Wright at the time. And um, Danny, obviously, has gone on done really, really well. And, um, yeah, he, he, he went across. And I think you never quite know what the conversations are. And I was quite happy at Deerham, and I wasn't necessarily too worried about... Um, progressing and, and, and going necessarily down that route so I didn't really ever kind of ask too many more questions on it Rob I remember sort of said to me that he didn't really want both of us going um, and whether they were slightly more keen on Danny whether they uh, or the club felt that Danny deserved the opportunity to go or what, whatever it was I, I don't I'd like to say I don't know but that was all it was I didn't really ever sort of go any further than that on, on that one um, and yeah and, and then there was one at, at, at Lower Stock which was after the first season that, that I was at Deerham, had made contact. They were still at our level, to be honest, but were obviously selling the vision that they were looking to to progress and, and go forward as they as they did end up doing, to be fair to them. But again, it was um, not really something that ever kind of interested me too much, to be honest. Um, I was always quite, quite happy. And then after that, the offers got less and less and less as uh, I got worse and worse, I think. So yeah, that, that was kind of it, really. But... Um, yeah, no, like I say, it was never really, um, never on my radar to, to ever think really about leaving, to be honest. I'm, I'm sure Deerham fans would, would disagree with your, your assessment there, but um, but but nonetheless, it was it was a, a stellar career. Something I, I do want to ask you about, and I know there was a, a tweet reference in this, was your, your time as caretaker boss in 2008, because you, you were pretty young at the time, right? So that must have been something that was pretty unexpected, but equally, did it kind of give you a taste for management and did it whet your appetite, I guess, to, to possibly move into that, to that position as, as your career progressed onwards? Yeah, I mean, it was, um, 
yeah, it, it it was certainly yeah. I was I, I imagine it raised quite a few eyebrows. It was I mean we we all knew what it was. I was, I was captain of the side at the time, and obviously the the manager it was Rob Taylor at the time had um had, had gone. Um, I remember Simon France, who was the chairman at the time, sort of rang me up and and sort of said, look, we we we, we need to kind of plan now um, for the next few weeks uh, of how it's going to look and you know things like training things like you know just organization generally do you know what I mean so um, I said you know as, as, as you do it's like yeah I'm, I'm happy to kind of help in whatever kind of way you, you see fit and um, yeah that's 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 what we've done um, he met with me Ollie and Nikki we, we went out for some food and we had a chat around um, like Barnsley said you know I'm thinking of this what what do you guys think and and yeah, we 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 were all like, yeah, you know, we'll we'll support each other, we'll we'll do it, and um, and and get the club through the, the kind of period. Because at the point, you know, you know, it's like DM's a very big club locally, and I think a lot of people were at that point probably thinking, you know, looking for us to fail, looking for things to fragment a little bit. You know, probably other clubs were thinking, cool, good chance to maybe look at players. You know, you'd never quite know what the relationship with the previous manager was, etc. So I think we were we were probably under the spotlight locally in football at that point. Um, Quite a bit. I'm pleased Twitter wasn't around then because I think there'd have probably been a lot of tweets flying about around uh, what a crazy idea it was, which I'd have probably read, took to heart, and worried about and all the rest of it. But um, yeah, we um, we got through it, and I think it was only for five games. Um, we, we had some quite good results as it happened, just because the lads rallied around and like you do when there's a little bit of uh, a situation like that, you all you know come out of it the other side and stick together, and that's that's what we've done. But yeah, it gave me a bit of an insight um, and. Yeah, I I I, I remember I, I I dropped um Cedric Anselm for a game and I I remember thinking what have I done here like he's he's a player that's like played with Zidane and played in a final for Bordeaux and all the rest of it and and I, I I'm sitting there thinking I don't think he's the right person to pick for this game tomorrow and it was uh, kind of at that point you think well actually that is what management is you have to make those calls and you have to be prepared to do what you think's right and that takes reputations and things like that out the window. And um, yeah, you have to do that, but it was never ever going to be at that point ever going to be more than just a, a literally just a, a stop gap until the, the, the club found the, the correct person, which they did in, uh, in, in Matt Hennon. So that's, that's kind of all it was really. So how old were you when, when you did take that, that role even temporarily? Uh, I think I was nine, 19. I think I was, yeah, 19. Blimey! So that's 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 still in, incredibly young to be thrust in a position like that. I mean, you're, you're very fortunate that, that Cedric is one of the nicest guys around, right? But <laughs> um, but do, do you do you kind of look back on on that spell now, given the role that you're in and, and the fact you do it every week? And do do you look at it and and kind of reflect on your inexperience, your youth at that time? I, I guess, or or have actually there there been some real lessons that you've learned from, even though it was just five games. The the lessons for me came after that so lessons in management really came um and, and i'm quite pleased the way we've we've done it in you know working our way if you like up to the position of, of at Deerham. um and yeah I, I i think lessons came for me at halston some lessons that um some i got away with because of the level and the squad that i was able to get i made mistakes but probably got away with certain bits because of that but i knew in my head that i made some mistakes um so that definitely happened with, without question and i still continue to do so don't get me wrong nobody uh i, I you know no one's stupid enough to say they don't make mistakes and i you know of course i still do that now but um you know i think you learn a lot of lessons like i did there um not so much the five games at dm i think the five games when i was 19 was just very much, it was a little snippet don't get me wrong and it was it was an eye-opener and it it probably tested my character as much as anything because you're you, you, your teammates with the lads one minute you're probably one of the youngest players in the team to then and being captain is quite a big responsibility in that field um to then like i say ultimately you know being the one that kind of makes a decision on what the team looks like and and trying to do that whilst playing as well which um which was an eye opener and i was anyone that's a player manager i certainly that wouldn't never be for me because very very difficult very very difficult you're really really conscious of your own performance because that effectively dictates what you kind of can and can't say in the change room and that's certainly how I felt I didn't really feel like I could say too much if I hadn't been at it myself and that created its own kind of I guess pressure internally where you're thinking so um, 
but all good experiences. And like I say, probably the character building for me personally doing that was probably the real good thing that on a personal level I got out of it, opposed to learning loads about managing a football club because um, I was fairly well protected with obviously everything else with the football club being, you know, I wasn't privy to any of that um, but because it was just a real stopgap, five games, can you get us through it and then we'll review it type thing. Did you, was, was it difficult to then go from, like you say, that maybe the relationship changed with teammates, certainly how you viewed it, like, like you say, leaving Cedric Ansel on out of, out, of, um, out of the team one week and then you have to go back to being a player. So was going back to being a player after that sort of brief spell, was, was that difficult? Did the dynamic change at all? No, it wasn't. I mean, and, and this, the lads, and, and this is what I say about always having a good group of lads at Dean, we always had that. And there were some really experienced players in, in the group. Obviously, Ollie, great support, um, friend as much as anything else at that time, and, and others and big characters in the change room. So um, that, that there, there wasn't, for, for me, there wasn't any um, what worry on, on, on that. It was always ever going to be, and that's what you know, we said to the lads, we need everyone buying. We're all in it together. We've all got to get through it. It's a funny one when a manager leaves. It always is going to be. It's a situation which... We've all got to get on with and manage as best we can. Um, and the collective buy-in was, 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 was brilliant from the lads and the transition back to playing was always going to be how it was always going to be. So, um, you know, there was never any kind of awkwardness or anything like that. Um, and the lads, when you reflect back on it, the lads at that point were just an unbelievable um, support and, and just we all got on with it. And that was, uh, that was it, really. Was there not a time after a couple of good results in in your youth where you kind of thought this this management likes okay I might might go for this permanently or, or were you or, or maybe not? No, no, never at that point. Paul, no, <laughs> no, never at that point. What I would say is I've always it's always interested me. I've, I've done the coaching badges um, very young, so I, that was really Simon's um, reasoning was that um, I'd done my UA for B as a a nineteen year old. I think I'd done it literally probably a matter of months. Completed it before. Um, actually, um, the, you know, everything happens that did it, Dylan. So um, I think but Simon was, was aware of that as well. And I think that probably was part of the reason with just sessions and just the whole whole kind of everything that was kind of required at that point um, kind of helped. So I've always had an interest in it. I've always, um, it's always been on my radar. But yeah, no, certainly not at a, a young age like that. It was always um, play. My, my, my outlook on playing was play uh, the best level you can for as long as you can and then there comes to that point where you can't quite do it where you want to do it and then you have to make the decision do I drop down or do I now look at how else I want to be involved in football and I again made that pretty that call pretty instinctively it was not quite there at Deer and went to Norwich United for probably two three months didn't wasn't wasn't the right fit both ways probably um, and that was that point where it was the realisation that actually I want to look at, at staying involved in the game because I couldn't not be. Um, and, and how does that look and, and how do I do it sort of thing? So, uh, so yeah, that was it really. And then, and then you became Halston boss in, in 2015. So talk to me about that process of becoming a, a manager and, and how that unfolded. Was Did you put yourself forward for the job? Was it a, um, did, did they come to you? How did that process kind of pan out? Well, before that, I was I'd, I'd, I'd done Nor Norfolk under eighteen, so that was the first one that. Um, so this is where my, me and Ollie, mine and Ollie's journey in management started. So we, um, I got asked by Norfolk County FA if I'd like to take um, the under eighteen side on, and um, and that was a perfect fit at the time because it, um, the commitment side of things wasn't huge. It's only a cup competition and six games against local counties. So from a personal point of view, it was the perfect fit because it was working with good standard of players. It was a nice environment. There wasn't the day-to-day, -day, um, you know, management of players and things like that. It, was, it, it wasn't that. Great opportunity to build relationships with local coaches, with local clubs and, 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 and with local young players, some of which still play in um, our side now and who have played for us. So it was a really, really good opportunity. Um, and yeah, got offered that. So first call was to Ollie, who um, was obviously still playing at the time, but just said to Ollie, this is a perfect opportunity for, for, for you to get involved if you want to. Um, you can still carry on with, with playing. 
and there might be the odd Saturday which crosses over, which we can deal with. But um, kind of, are you up for it? Which obviously he was, um, and that's how we we we, we started. So um, yeah, Ollie came in, and that was that. So we've done that for probably a year, two years, and then the Halston situation was a was a, a unique one. So I um, one of the lads who was involved had sort of mentioned it to me. He played for Halston, a friend of mine, um, and then the actual manager of Halston rang me up to ask me if I wanted his job. So it was a bit of a unique one, not not something that's probably too uh, too commonly done, but it was uh, it was actually the manager at the time who basically sort of said, and who had done an unbelievable job with Halston. He'd taken them from Division 4 right the way into the Premier Division. Um, and, and I think it kind of just, in his mind, maybe felt he'd done everything he could. Craig Trudgell, um, he'd, he'd done fantastic, and still does fantastic work at Halston. But he'd... he'd kind of spoke to me and said, look, I, I, I think, you know, I've, I've done my bit. I'm kind of, you know, looking for the right person to maybe come in and, 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 and take it on. And obviously I, I knew Craig actually played in the same youth team as his, his, his brother, um, James. Um, and, and, that, and that's how it came about. And yeah, it was, uh, it was kind of a bit out of the, the blue, really. It wasn't um, something that, that, you know, I was, foresaw or anything like that I didn't have a great knowledge of the Anglian Combination League or anything like that at the time so it was like quite an exciting um, opportunity at a level which you know I, I think was the right thing to do I don't think people should go in and get managerial jobs straight away at a club that's at a really good level I felt it was the right thing to do at that time um, and what a decision because what an unbelievable club they are um, as well Harleston and the chairman there it just an unbelievable club, fantastic people there. I can't say enough positive words about the club and gave me an opportunity when they didn't have to. Um, and that was that was how it came about. And obviously had what will have been, I think, four four really good seasons there. And and Deerham was, was the only club we would ever, ever leave Halston for. And that is the God's honest truth. It would never have been anyone else um, that could have that could have lured us away from there. So, um, yeah, that's that's how it how it all came about, and 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 yeah, we had a good successful time there, which thankfully Deerham saw, and and again we were given the opportunity to, to move on. It, it was interesting earlier that you you kind of mentioned the mistakes you made as in in your first senior job, if if you want to describe it like that, first senior job in in local football. Equally, yeah, I mean you you achieved a promotion, you you were top of the league when you when you left for Deerham. So, how do you how do you kind of look at the job overall that you did there in, like you say, a, a, a few years? It, it, do you reflect on that with positivity about the, the job you did? Or, or do you, I suppose it's, it's probably human instinct to some extent to maybe focus on the areas that, or, or the little mistakes that maybe you made, but equally they can help shape you as a, as a coach, can't they? Yeah, massively. I, I made one huge mistake. We, we lost two games one season and we didn't win the league. And one of the games on reflection, um, what I learned about Halston was was the importance of building the squad and having the right people involved. And what what I done for a game, I'll tell you what I done. I signed uh, for Danny Crow for a game, and this is nothing against Danny because he's an unbelievable player, fantastic player, um, and obviously good enough to play Anglian Com at the time. Um, but what I'd done was I'd signed him for a game against um, Spitzworth, who were the side that were up there with us, and. Uh, and, and as I'd done it, I could see it in the warm-up. I could see the Spitzworth lads looking at us thinking, you think, you, you think you've got one over here by signing him. And, and I could just see it pump them up to a point where it, it just channeled their mind to win the game of football. And I could see our lads thinking, you know, Coy's brought him in for one game to play to try and win the game of football. And, you know, I've been here all season. I'm now on the bench. And it, it taught me. And in, in, in that game, I went home and I was like, I've copped up there because I knew straight away that actually... You've got your group of players, you've got your squad, um, you win together, you lose together, and actually that's how things should be done. And um, it was a it was it was a, a definitive moment for me that actually it's not getting the best players in terms of ability on the football pitch. Yeah, there's an element to that, and of course you have to have quality, but actually it's the other things that make a good squad, make a good team, that camaraderie, that morale, that togetherness, that when you turn up on a match day, there's a positive energy and all that sort of stuff that isn't ability based, but is equally as important in terms of getting results and, and, and being effective. And that day I got it wrong. I got it completely wrong. And 
the day before I thought I'd got it so right and uh, you know, I couldn't, couldn't have been more different in my opinions from that moment on the day before when, when we'd got it sorted to the actual day of the game and after the game where you reflect on it. So little things like that that you just pick up. Um, Utilisation of the squad, again, is something that's really important and um, again, I've never done it in the first season at Halston and then it was very difficult for players to feel part of it. Um, so it was recognising opportunities where you could do that and managing that effectively and not just throwing the same eleven out every single game when you can probably not, you know, you don't have to do that and you can keep everyone happy sort of thing. So little things like that that just kind of, you know, crop up as they do and you just learn how to, I guess, manage it and, and learn from it, like I say. So, yeah. It's interesting the anecdote you, you tell there. One, because it's probably in contrast to maybe what you spoke about with Cedric and dropping him in that spell as, as five games and having, I guess, the, the the guts to do that. But equally, because people will, will look at you as a former Norwich player. You've, you've mentioned some players that you played with, the, obviously, Rossi Jarvis, Andrew Fisk, Andrew Cave Brown. Some of those have, have had really good local playing careers, haven't they? Um, we, could, we could name numerous others as well there will be some people that, that will have expected you just to use that contact book and, and almost put them into side. So, so it's interesting what you said there about maybe being bitten quite early on by, by maybe going for a name as opposed to looking at the overall structure of a side a little bit and how that contrasts with maybe what you did as a, as a teenager when you got that brief spell at Deerham. Yeah, absolutely. A really, really good point. And um, I think there's... Our recruitment, we haven't got a set. This is the, this is the only sort of player that we, we go after or we think about. Um, I think you need to have a balance. But what I would say is I, I love players. I love giving players an opportunity. And that is something that we've always done. With, with and, and invariably, you're giving players an opportunity at a young age because that's generally, you don't generally go and sign a, a 35-year-old who's not ever played at the level because that's just not how it works. But um, that's something that... that it's my personally I love doing and and that's kind of my ethos I guess is to to give lads an opportunity um because I think you can you can shape players a little bit and you can help them and they come in a bit rough and a bit raw and I'll use one that we've got at the minute because everyone I, I like Luke Johnson who's come from Kings Lynn who's never really played he's 18 he's never he's been at Kings Lynn obviously and had a good grounding through his youth um you know and stuff um but he's an example for me of someone who's hungry who's keen who wants to play he's 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 got a lot there's a lot there to polish he's got a lot of attributes he's nowhere near there but he's got a lot that we can work with and he's an example there's others that we will have signed through years that have gone by but he's an example at the moment in the here and now of somebody that is in my opinion the sort of player that we we, we really like to go and get because you know i think there's someone there that we can bring through with us and he's got that hunger and that attitude to improve and and yeah we love that's what we love doing giving those lads opportunities not naive enough to think that in the league we are in that you can't you can't have 11 Luke Johnsons young lads that are learning a bit and and aren't experienced and so a bit to, to understand but it's yeah making sure that we have enough Luke Johnsons that will go through hopefully our system at the club and having that experience and know how alongside it to to help and to make sure we've got a balanced squad that we need to try and be successful. So, yeah, that's uh, that's kind of it really. And our recruitment will probably reflect that. You know, we signed Sean Mullins at the time, who was a great signing for us, and played a huge part in keeping us in the division. Now Sean was thirty four at the time when we signed him, maybe thirty three, thirty four, um, but was a key signing for us at the point because we needed that experience, that leadership, that know how. Um, you know, so again, it just shows that different players at different points will be you know who, who we go after and, and and there'll be different reasons why we do that but um yeah that's kind of the point you make i guess is is true we, we don't go and just get big names for the sake of it because i don't think that's the right recruitment model um to to to, to, to have and we and we can't afford you know that's not a realistic model for for our football club and we wouldn't want it to be and, and let's be honest, there are some non-league sides who do do that, who do throw money at, at these ex-professionals for, for, for sort of cheap publicity and stuff like that. I can see we've got a few comments. So um, 
I will, I will I'll get through those with, with Gus in a moment um, once we've, we've finished talking about Deerham. I'm going to go off on a bit of a tangent here, but I think it will make sense when I make it, if it's formalising the way it is in my head. But I'm reading um, Eddie Hearn, the boxing promoter's book at the moment. And obviously he, he works now for, for the company that was kind of created by his father, Barry Hearn. And, and there's an interesting chapter where he talks about going off and, and learning and, and almost wanting to feel like he stepped into that company stepped into the role that he had when he was ready for it, as opposed to just because he was someone's son. And um, obviously it's, it's kind of a different situation, but I, I kind of get that from, from you and Deerham town, you wanted to go off and prove yourself as a manager before making that step up to a club that I think everyone can see means so much to you in terms of the process. And, and you said, and, and obviously there, there were quotes at the time when you were appointed about Deerham being the only club you, you would have considered um, if, if they came calling how were you first made of or made aware of, of that interest and what was your, your thought process at the time around leaving Halston and, and then joining Deerham? That's a long question, but I, th- I think my point is that. No, no, and I'll be yeah, completely um, transparent about it. So um, uh, yeah, we, 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 we're, we're at Halston. Um, we, so we got promoted from the Anglian combination into to the furlough none. And we were, I think it was nine points, maybe 10 points clear. Um, at, at Halston top of the league. So we, we'd, we'd obviously, you know, we'd done well and we're, we're probably, um, you know, obviously people were taking note of how, how well Halston were doing. Um, so we'd got contacted by um, Neil Sturm, who was the chairman at Deerham at the time. Um, and we, we, we were very much, it was a real, it's a, a very difficult situation because we were very much um, committed to Halston. We wanted to finish the season with Halston because we were on to win the league and, you know, we were in a good position um, and we were very much, it, 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 I think it was kind of a, a contact that was made. It was almost along the lines of, you know, if it came about, would, would, would it be something that's of interest? And we kind of didn't want to engage any further in that and kind of at that point said, look, we're not, that's not the way to, to, that we can really go about it. We kind of just, if, if that's where that's going, then ask us and we make a decision because we can't second guess we can't say well hypothetically speaking would you or anything like that so we kind of um really and i'll be completely honest i'll be completely honest at the point weirdly didn't want a decision to make i kind of want in my head everything how i wanted it to work was that we would finish the season with halston hopefully win the league with halston then the opportunity would be there and we could do it nice and cleanly without disrupting what we were doing at Halston and without um, Neil Simmons leaving at any other time other than the end of the season. That was in our ideal scenario, how we wanted things to, to work. But obviously things didn't um, pan out like that. And, and, and we got the call. So we we'd just actually, it was one of the games we'd lost at Halston. We lost at home to Lakenheath um, 2-1. And Deerham had lost 4-1 at Tilbury, I think it was, something like that. And um, and then we got yeah asked if we would um, if we wanted to take it on that that was basically it and um, yeah it was difficult it was a difficult one it was like I say a real tough tough decision but we we probably always knew in our hearts that it you know as it was dear and it was probably always going to be us wanting to to go there opposed to 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 staying at Halston and finishing that season off and um, yeah real difficult one because like I say Halston unbelievable club the chairman I just is a absolute diamond there just such a unbelievable bloke and and I felt we were a little bit dropping them in it I guess because like I say things were going so well and and everything was on that path um, but at the same time it it, it it was an opportunity that was just too too big as we all know um, to turn down so that's that was kind of how it all, all panned out. And um, yeah, I think it was then that next week we'd, we'd agreed everything um, and, and took charge for the, the game the following Saturday, I think it was against Haybridge. So um, yeah, it all happened fairly quickly. Mm, and, and on the pitch, it was obviously a, a team struggling. They, they were battling for, for survival at the time. What, what sort of club did you find yourself walking into? Were you kind of prepared for the the challenge ahead? Uh, it, it sounds like it all happened fairly quickly, so maybe there wasn't necessarily that time to actually sit down and, and reflect about what you were walking into. It was it was kind of going in, and then I suppose it's is about entering firefighting mode and, and and just doing all you can to get some points on the board and quickly. It, yeah, it was exactly that, and we we um, 
I'll be honest, we walked in and and you it was such I, I remember I, I said to Ollie we put the first session on and we 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 spoke obviously on our about before and I said, look, we've just got to be really enthusiastic, we've got to get and believe and we've really got to try and swing that around because it is gonna be it's gonna be tough and and you know, it's like anything, isn't it? We go in there and, and they're judging us as much as we're judging them as to be fair at the start. So um you know, it, it and and it was it was such you could just tell the lads had such little confidence as you would do if you're bottom of the league. Uh, you could see they were carrying the, the the weight of the world on their shoulders, and and it was really how forget tactics for a moment. How do we get out of that pattern? How do we somehow create them to be in a position where they don't feel like that and they can go into games with a bit of belief and a bit of confidence and if it doesn't quite work well do you know what we've still got a bit of time and and that was kind of how we got that into their way of thinking very early on so um and and but what i would say is they've done that with performances and um you know I, I, listen let's not kid ourselves we had reese logan come back from injury um that tied in with us coming so i'm not gonna um hide behind the fact that he he came back into the side and gave everyone a big lift because of the player he is, the quality he has. Um, and again, it would be wrong of me to, to, to name names because every single member of that squad played their part in getting us out of that out of that position. Every single one of them did. But I would probably highlight um, Reid coming back into the side, Joe Gatting and Crispy at the time, just a goal threat. And, and we made the decision early, and, and I remember speaking to Ryan and, and just said, look, I'm, we are going to play you and Joe up front and you are going to get us out. You're going to get us out because you've both got the quality. You're both going to score the goals to get us out of the problems we're in. Um, and with Hippo, obviously, on the other side, who's also been injured a bit and was then coming back in as a front four, um, those four were, were a constant threat. And we were able to then get teams on the back foot. We were able to then get you know, goals and always believe we'd get goals. And, and that going into games really is massive confidence to have. So um, we've done that. Our captain, Hintz, was unbelievable. Um, you know what you're getting with Hintz, but I felt for that final three months of the season, just led us brilliantly on the pitch, led us out of the, 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 the position we were in. Um, but like I say, it was, it was everyone. It was, you know, everyone had to play their part to get us out of that position. And, and the lads, full credit to them, done that. And it wasn't easy because at the start we had Haybridge who were brilliant, end up winning the playoffs, I think. Um, they beat us 3-1. We then had Averley who was second in the league and Coggeshall who were in the playoffs as well. It's the next two games. And you're sort of th sitting there thinking, well, we ain't probably going to get too much, but we managed to get a draw out of both those games. And I think that gave us the confidence to say, right, we've drawn with those two teams. We can probably believe now that we can we can start turning it around. And um and, and luckily we did, and we, we we got out with, I think probably four games to spare in the end. So we'd, uh, yeah, it was it was a great effort from everyone. It's been a, a relatively short managerial career so far for you. Still a, a very young man. Where where does that sort of achievement of staying up? Obviously, it was the, the Norfolk Senior Cup as well for, thrown in, which um, must have been a, a nice added bonus to sort of cap off that season. But where does that kind of rank in terms of the your achievements as a manager so far? Obviously, the the promotion at at Halston, I expect, is, is is probably up there as well. Where where do you kind of place that? Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd put it up there probably with the promotion at Halston. Obviously, the promotion at Halston, very different. Halston, there was expectation that we, we would we'd go up. And I think that's very difficult sometimes when you have that level of expectation is 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 performing in that kind of um, setting, if you like. And, and we did. Um, so that was, I guess, that kind of um, achievement is, is in one hand. And then possibly at Deerham, um, it was, I guess, a little bit around the other side that, you know, we're in a position where we're bottom of the league. It can only get better. If we go down, well, we've done no worse than what was happening. And that was kind of a little bit the, I guess, the, the, the not the approach, but you, you are in that position and, and you are kind of viewed in that position. So it, it was in a, in a roundabout way, a, a, a nice-ish position to go into because, you know, I say there weren't really anything to lose um, with the position we were in. So, a different challenge. Um, I think the biggest one at Deerham was I, I felt we were able to, to to probably turn the, like I said a moment ago, alluded to it, the um, whole kind of 
atmosphere and 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 that around quickly and we didn't have time to waste you know we we couldn't not do that i think if we'd have carried on in that mindset and a few more bad results and not got things possibly right with the lads we brought in and the way we tried to play I think we might have then been on a real sticky wicket to get out of the situation we were in because um, the pressure just intensifies. Teams then pull away from you and, and you're sitting there thinking, right, we, we have to win the next game. And if we don't, we, we really are up against it. So I think that was probably the bit on that half a season where if you pinpoint how, from our side of things, we probably affected it, it was recruitment, style of play in terms of utilising our strengths and getting them into games very, very early. Um, and just trying to build the atmosphere at, at the club. And, and I have to mention Chris Linehan on that because Chris, who came along with us from from Halston, was, again, a great energy in the changing room. And, and that was a real, like I say, a real key part to, um, to, 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 to how we wanted to try and spin things around. And, um, yeah, we, 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 we kind of done that. And obviously, Ollie, you know, hugely part of that, um, of course, as well. It's, it's, it's a, a weird thing that, that you've been in charge for what, just over two years now and yet you've only had one full season in in charge so sitting where we we are at the moment how do you kind of assess your your time at the club and and, and maybe the 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 trajectory that, that you guys are on as a football club do you do you feel like you you are on the on the right path do you still feel like there's there's plenty more more work to do I mean obviously you it comes across that, that you're, you're still a very ambitious very passionate guy what, what would be your aims in the next let's say season or or, or two for the club and uh, and how do you go about trying to to get yourselves towards the the top end of the division it's particularly given we, we're speaking about um as we mentioned right at the top of of our chat a club that maybe doesn't have the spending powers of of some others at this level yeah i, I think the key part we, we've always said the key part is season on season improvement that that is that for me is how I should be measured um, and I think we've we've achieved that I think the season not the one we're in but the one before um, well we were, we were we were eighth I think we were nine points off the playoffs we we were we were very much an outside shot at the playoffs but we felt we were possibly in the picture we were hitting a bit of form um, and, and, and and we were you know going to try and have a go I think where, where we were we probably wouldn't have got in but it was kind of tangible evidence if you like at that point that we'd improved because the season before we were bottom when we took over we end up finishing 14th so I think we were satisfied on that front and um, and that's the key and the key for us is the, like I say the tangible uh, evidence of it will be trying to get into the playoffs that is for us the next challenge of well, the club's never been there we've been in the league for probably close to well, about nine seasons now and we haven't um, we haven't achieved it and that would be something that is uh, well not is it definitely is an aspiration of ours um and we want to and i'm not afraid to say it we want to certainly over this next you know three to four years we, we really want to be trying to get to the next level of football um and and that's what we, we we've got to try and do and that's what again going back to structurally at the club and getting everything right that is the direction that we're trying to get in um, and that's everything that's obviously on the pitch of course and that's where it's judged and, and ultimately that's what will happen but it's the whole club because to be able to go up you do have to have facilities you do have to have things that help your cause away from just the playing side of it and that's where Ash and the guys are brilliant because we know that we are getting supported in every way possible with that um, the financial side of things is, is 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 something that we're aware we're all aware of that, but we, that isn't a reason to not be able to achieve what we want to achieve, and that's the key focus from us. We've got great youth set up, we've got um, uh, a uniqueness in the position we're in, in that we aren't, you know, we're we're we're, we're above in the pyramid teams that are below us, and we have to utilise that fact. And again, it comes back to getting the right players and the hungry players that want to ch challenge themselves. Um, and we've got a good, real, real good group of players that we have at our football club. And it's getting, like I say, the, the two or three alongside those that will help us go to the next the next level. So um, that's the aspiration. And you're right, ambition and having those those targets has to be part of what we're doing. And, um, and that's what it is. So, you know, I don't think we're far off. I think we're a little bit off. 
and that's the challenge with recruitment. That's the challenge now going into next season is to not be a little bit off, is to to be right in amongst it, and uh, and that's what we'll be trying to achieve. Just finally for me, and then we'll we'll go to some questions we've got in the in the comments on YouTube. For for you personally, kind of a very young manager. What what are your ambitions from this point? You you maybe spoke about maybe not a lack of ambition. It's probably the wrong term as a player, but maybe not necessarily that desire that others had to push up the levels. Is is that something you have as a manager? I'm talking in terms of the long term here. Obviously, short term. We we know your commitment to Deerham Town, but is is that something you'd, you'd like to do? Hopefully, with Deerham, of course, move up the levels and uh, and try and sort of pit your wits against managers higher up the pyramid. There's of course so many examples now in, in, in English football, um, however far up the pyramid you go, of, of managers who, who've got really good jobs off doing some, some really good work in, in non-league. Is that something you, you aspire to be? Or are, are you kind of more focused on, on the short term? Um, that's a great question. Um, no is the answer. I'm, I'm not looking to, to try and pursue um, a career as a, uh, becoming a professional football manager no because I go back to it I, I'm realistic with stuff and um, you know I, you've got a, you know your, your working life which is obviously very important and and, and yeah I don't think well, where, where I really really want to get to with it is with Deerham is to take the football club to the next level and to try and keep doing that for as as long as we can and obviously that's very challenging of course it is um but that's certainly all my my focus. It, it it wouldn't. It's not of a massive interest to me to go and try and manage a I don't know a national league south club on a sort of full time basis and just not 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 for me. Um, I just don't think that's that's what I'd want to do. Um, not because I don't enjoy it because I would, but it's not. Um, I just think in terms of life and. And, and everything else, I think, you know, that's a big, big gamble on your family and stuff that um, I wouldn't personally be comfortable making. But where I would, what I would love to happen is for us at Deerham to to take the football club um, up to the next level and the level after that and, and see where we can get to. That That is, for me, if, if somebody could say, look, paint your perfect journey as a manager, that would be it to take the football club to the Football League. I know Greg Bell, one of our supporters, is... Uh, 12 years time we'll be in the Champions League not quite sure that will happen but but in all seriousness trying to take us on a journey and um, and yeah that that's all my focus is and all I want to do really Brilliant stuff and, and just before we do go to the comments I know you're, you're very keen to point out there's a graphic on Twitter that said you only had 30 goals you're very keen to point out it was 36 that's right isn't I, it? I think yeah I just think Ben Williamson probably just forgot to add in Norfolk Senior Cup goals and FA Bars goals. I think that's all I can put it down to, to be honest, because he sold me short of six goals. So, um, so yeah, not not that I'm not that I went on the phone and went on the notes section and wrote every single goal I ever scored for Dim. I definitely didn't do that. Um, I wouldn't be sad enough to do that. Um, but yeah, I think he might have been six out. So um, yeah, I'll give him a bit of a hard time at some point for that. There we go. An important clarification that we that we need to make. Right, let's um, move on to some of your questions to finish the evening. Um, we'll start with Ben Ambrose, uh, who has uh, said, is Gus looking for a left back? I know someone with a worldie of a left foot. I presume he's not talking about himself. So um, I'm sure he'll pass that contact over to you. Yeah, well, I've, I've seen what his hair's looking like at the minute. I'd be worried he wouldn't see the ball if he played football, to be honest. It'd be in his eyes all the time. So yeah, I can't see... Uh, can't see that one happening, Ben. You stick to the media stuff, mate. You're uh, you're unbelievably good at that, so we'll leave it there. Yeah, and he's he's got a face. He's got a face for radio as well, so um, that's 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 where he's suited. Um, global, <laughs> global bloodstock has uh, asked, how about a round robin Norfolk Senior Cup groups of four play each other home and away, winners and runners up go through to the semi final, and then a final at the end of it. What what are your thoughts on that? Because uh, it's it's an incredibly important competition for this county, and obviously one that that Deerham and, and and yourself have have had success in recently. Yeah, I I think there is something there. I do. I think. Um... Listen, we, we all want to, everyone's chomping at the bit, aren't they, to, to have some sort of um, competitive, meaningful football. Um, personally, not a massive fan of, you know, organising friendlies in March and April to, to fill a game. Yeah, we, we might do that, but I think if we could do something, um, then we would, I would suggest, probably support it as a club. Obviously, it'd be a club decision as well, because we'd have to think about everything. Um, but I think, yeah, I, I think... Um, Something along those lines, it now seems might be a possible fit, which 
I'm sure everyone would be uh, would be really really keen to do. And we've we've seen that with some competitions in the professional game, haven't we? They got pushed into into this season. Um, Alfred Barnard has said after after management, any thoughts about taking up refereeing? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Alfred, I think you know the answer to that one. Um, yeah, no, um, that's probably one area of the game where, um, I, yeah, I'm not sure I'd be, uh, be well, I say that. I, listen, I, I do come across sometimes a bit harsh on referees and maybe that's something I need to work on as well. But it's a tough, tough job for them. But, um, yeah, I, I sometimes just think there could be a lot more work done. Probably, and I'm probably going a bit deep here and probably don't need to be doing this, but... I think there's a lot. I think refereeing as a whole should be looked at as a, an overall um, package, if you like, from recruitment to courses to assessors to how that process works to actually what is required of a referee now is very, very different to what's required of a referee five years ago, ten years ago. And I don't think there'll have been too much changes in the you know how the whole process works in that period of time to go alongside what's now needed you know we look at stats now and jack you know a stat is that that is deemed these days as a brilliant stat for for football is that if a player gets fouled it's deemed brilliant that's fantastic play from that player jack Grealish is top of it with over 100 fouls already this season and it's deemed as a really really good piece of play and really good for him you go back five years ten years that would be probably deemed as a terrible stat and Jack Grealish would be getting hammered for not releasing the ball quick enough. So that's just a mini example of how the game evolves and and I don't think referees have evolved with it. And I've seen it. I see it all the time. So I come at it from a informed position, in my opinion. Mm, well, well, I watch, um, as you know, championship football every week and... Um, I can certainly speak that the, the the standard is is no better at that level. So I, I think we can say, and obviously I'm a fairly regular oldest park as well. And I wouldn't say there's too much. Obviously, the standards of, of football is very different, but in terms of the standard of referee, and it it does seem to be the same. There seems to be a little bit of a um, a, a little bit of a gap in quality at the moment, which I, I think we'd we'd all like to see resolved, particularly with the money that's that's in the game at present. Um, Peter Dugdale has said, oh, just quickly before we move on to the referees' points, just remind me, I was I was going to say I saw a clip of Neil Warnock. Um, that's that Sheffield United documentary, it gives you a run for for your money in that. I, I don't, I don't know what you think about that, but um, but yeah, he's made a career out of it. So so I don't know if you saw that clip of him at the under twenty threes game no. where, he's, where he's berating the official. He's not even on the touchline. So, um, <laughs> oh god, yeah. So, don't so, surprise me with him. <laughs> no, certainly hearing him behind closed doors, it's uh, it's it's pretty much all he does. And um, Peter Dugdale, I said, I saw earlier um, that they might. Uh, restructure the leagues like they were planning from last season. What's your opinion of this? Oh, yeah, really good question. Um, yeah, so so talking around um, potentially a sideways move where Deerham are concerned. So where you know whether we would move sideways to another league. I think potentially that's what that that would mean. Um, yeah, it's something again we'd we'd have to if that was an, an option we'd have to really weigh it up as a club and. And, and and make make a decision on it really. So um, yeah, something that that wouldn't rule in, would wouldn't rule out, would have to be a club decision, not a on the pitch football decision. It would have to be a, a whole decision as a football club. And and I go back to it with the guys we've got at the club, um, with us all, we'd you know make sure that that is done in the best interest of the club, and would have confidence that you know if if we did move or if we didn't, it would be for all the right reasons. So um, yeah. Potentially, that's something again that was been that's been earmarked for a couple of seasons. Obviously, with everything that's gone on, it's kind of been paused. But yeah, I think Peter's right. It has been mentioned that that process still or is going to happen potentially at the end of this season. So um, yeah, we'll see see what what options might be available to us and, and go from there. Yeah, very much watch this space. We'll end with a, a couple from from Greg Bell. Uh, he's keen to point out there's only 82 days until you can get a round in, so that's very positive. <laughs> um, and then his uh, his final question is: uh, do, you, do you want me to start uh, a 14 years to the Champions League to be a bit more realistic? I was going to say after 12 years, I'm feeling the pressure a little bit. I mean, it, these grey hairs that I'm getting here are probably because he's put in 12 years that we need to be in the Champions League. So yeah, I'd. If he can, ex- yeah. If he can extend it to fourteen, I'm pretty sure we'll be able to do it in fourteen. But twelve is probably a little bit tight. So, yeah, if he could, that'd be great. 
<laughs> there we go, Gus. Thank you very much for for joining us. It's been a, a, an excellent hour or so of, of chat. Thank you all very much for watching. Of course, we'll try and bring you uh, some some more of these fairly regular. I'm not sure who's who's coming on next, so I can't spoil that for you. I'm sure um, someone will will point it out and, and we'll uh, we'll get it on socials as soon as possible. But we'll keep you up to date with all the information as as we push towards hopefully the start of next season and, and getting back to Oldest Park and watching some football as well. Thank you all very much for watching. Stay safe. And we'll see you again very, very soon.